How's it going everybody? I'm Lou Shiva with Worldwide Corals and we're here at the Florida Aquarium and today we're going to look into why the corals in Florida are going extinct. So follow me along as I meet with Carrie O'Neill and we give you guys a tour of the facility. All right, Carrie, we've been doing a lot of walking around. Yeah. Now can you tell me where we're at right now? Yes, yeah, so we are in one of our coral spawning laboratories. So in this room is where we're providing the corals with all of those seasonal cues that they need to know it's time to actually spawn once a year on their annual cycle. Interesting. Tell me a little bit more about that spawning in, in here. Yeah, so in these systems, the corals are getting a set sunrise and sunset time that changes slightly every day, um, as well as the moon phase. So we actually have, um, the moon's not up right now, but we have ping pong balls over a warm white LED, and all of this is controlled by the season table in the apex and they're programmed to mimic sunrise and sunset in Key Largo, Florida. So okay. all of the corals that we work with here originate from Florida waters. So we want to program this system to mimic something that they would actually be getting in the wild. And then the temperature changes over the course of the year wow. based on data from the ocean that we know um, how that temperature fluctuates from winter to summer. Okay. Now a lot of these corals would probably be extinct without you guys helping out and trying to trying to figure out what's going on with them with the disease down there. Yeah, it's pretty wild to say that, but the majority of the corals in this tank, except all, all of the pillar corals in this tank, except for one, are no longer alive in the wild. So their parent colony that uh -huh. they were originally fragmented from has since died from stony coral tissue loss disease. And we've actually lost 98% of our pillar corals in Florida over the past six years. And it, Really, the future for this species is right here in this tank. So yeah. these corals spawn every August. They produce literally millions of larvae in this one aquarium system. And we hold 200 individuals here at our center so we can change what parents are spawning and make a really diverse set of offspring. And in the wild, there's only 24 of these corals left on all of Florida's reef. And most of them are so far apart that the sperm and the eggs may never even find each other to make offspring. So they're considered functionally extinct in Florida wow. because they can't actually recover on their own without human intervention. So it's a really sad situation, but at least, you know, scientists in Florida and the Florida Aquarium were able to get in there and get fragments of these corals, get them out of the ocean, yeah. keep them happy and healthy, and now actually making offspring for the future. So these pillar corals, they've been around for millions of years? Even the individual coral that you see here, its parent colony was thousands of years old. So some of the larger corals in the Florida Keys, they've been measured through their skeleton that they are in fact multiple thousands of years old. So to have lost 98% of them yeah. in five or six years really shows you how rapidly and drastically our environment is changing. Yeah. Um, so to be able to prevent this species that's been around that long from being completely lost is, is really something special that sure. we couldn't do without the help of the hobby. And the yeah. equipment that we use in this room is really all available to home hobbyists mm -hmm. and being manufactured because of home hobbyists. So we have radion lights and apex mm -hmm. control systems and we have octo skimmers and you know pulse pumps. All of these things are allow us to save these species from extinction. So this is kind of like science and the hobbies kind of marrying each other and uh coming to life here at the Florida Aquarium. Yeah, it's Pretty the hobbyists amazing. that drive this innovation yeah. of all of this equipment and technology. And then we are the ones that can put it all together and use it in a way that we can actually do conservation work and restoration work for corals in Florida. All right, Carrie, now explain to me what's going on over here on this board. It looks sure. pretty nice. So we. This system is mimicking all of the seasonal temperature cues by using the apex season table. So all of the lights and the moon and also the temperature control are controlled by the apex. Okay. So our chiller and heaters are plugged into the apex. All of the radions, are, these are older radions, so they're going through a WXM module, um, which is, is no longer an option, but these are actually Gen 4 radions. And then we have a lunar simulator module controlling the moons. 
Um, and all of that in the season table is programmed to be mimic what they would get in Key Largo. Wow. So we've picked a point on the map and said, okay, what are the what's the data that we need to put into that right. season table for sunrise, sunset, moon phase, yeah. moon intensity, solar intensity, um, and all of what these corals are experiencing is being controlled by that apex. Wow. One thing too we've learned with these systems is we didn't even know when some of these corals spawn because prior to stony coral tissue loss disease, people weren't even really looking for it. Yeah. So one of the corals in this tank over here, the maize coral, nobody even knew when to watch for it to right. spawn. So one of the huge advantages of having these in a tank with the shifted cycle is yeah. we can literally look at them every day right. and say, is it spawning, is it spawning? And then over the course of a year, we can discover when it spawns. And now we right. know this species spawns 15 days after the full moon of October, which wow. is completely different than most other Caribbean coral species. Mm -hmm. So that's why nobody ever knew. Because who's out there diving on the 15th <laughs> night after the full moon of October every so year true. watching yeah. the maize coral? Yeah. It just doesn't happen. No, no. So you mentioned that these are the very first corals that spawn in captivity. Tell me more. I'm so excited to learn. Yeah, so we were the first to spawn any Atlantic coral uh -huh. in captivity or in the lab. So most of you probably know Jamie Craggs, mm -hmm. who who yeah, had Jamie. worked with Indo-Pacific corals at his lab at the Horniman Museum, and he had spawned some of the Indo-Pacific Acropora mm -hmm. um, at a smaller scale and, and was raising them at the Horniman Museum. Yeah. And we said, okay, we need to use that technology to do this for Atlantic corals. Sure. And actually these pillar coral behind you, these yeah. were the first corals that we induced to spawn here. So this yeah. was in 2019, mm -hmm. this was the first Atlantic Ooh. coral species to ever be spawned in an aquarium. Wow. Um, and, and it was so critically important for them because of what was happening to them in the wild mm -hmm. where we were no longer able to get offspring from yeah. the wild. They don't exist anymore um, without major human intervention. So bringing right. them all here, putting these corals were found anywhere from Fort Lauderdale to Key West in the wow. wild. Wow. But now they're all sitting right next to each other yeah. and they can cross with each other. So, so it's all on the same Florida reef track, basically. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Everything here is from Florida. The corals, the rocks, the snails, the, everything um, has to originate from the Florida reef track. Yeah. And by doing that, we are then allowed to release things back out into the Florida reef track yeah. because we haven't cross contaminated potentially with something from another ecosystem. Got gotcha, you. Gotcha. Okay, so this live rock down here is actually from Florida? Yep, so wow. live rock all comes from Florida, snails, urchins, everything comes from Florida. And not only does it just come from Florida, mm. but we have to ensure that the whole chain of custody from the minute that organism is taken out of the ocean and goes to a wholesaler wow. or whoever collects it, it doesn't come in contact with something from the Pacific yeah. or even somewhere else in the Caribbean yeah. um, because it could pick up something even in transit. So we work very closely with several vendors in the Keys to say, okay, we want live rock, but I need you to keep it completely separate yeah. from the time you take it out of your live rock farm in the ocean yeah. and bring it to our facility. These are cool looking. These guys are some of my favorites. So yeah. on the back there, this is Deploria labyrinthiformis, or the grooved brain okay. coral. And these guys are really cool because they spawn just before sunset. Uh -huh. So the, the lights will still be on when yeah. they're spawning. And it's just awesome. Um, and then the maize coral, this right. one is also very heavily impacted by stony coral tissue loss disease. Yeah. And then this is the knobby brain coral. <laughs> um, and these guys cool. are great for the spawning tank because they spawn at two o'clock in the morning. Oh. So you definitely don't want to have to stay and wait for them to spawn. So they're perfect to add into the tank that's no. shifted in yeah. time. So they still spawn at 10 p.m. even in this tank. Okay, um, okay. That's a little bit better than 2 a.m. It's better than yeah. 2 a.m., yeah. Yeah. Uh, all night long with Lionel Richie. <laughs> yeah, and we and we have we have music that we play for them really? too. Yeah, we have Big Barry White on the Spotify oh, playlist. Oh wow! Yeah. wow. Yeah, we that's have Barry a, White. We have a that's publicly a publicly available Spotify playlist <laughs> for coral spawning. That's spawning. fantastic. It's part of the scientific research, Lou. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. You can turn the other way. Yeah. <laughs> sorry, guys. Sorry. <laughs> that's cool. I see a little uh, Christmas tree worm coming out of there. Yeah, I love yeah. Them. They yeah. very frequently are are found in these. Caribbean brain corals. Wow, they're pretty. 
Has any of these corals actually made it back into the ocean yet? Yeah, so we have released close to 20,000 offspring back into the ocean from the corals here at our center. Thank you for that. That's yeah, amazing. and it's still yeah. it's still just a tiny drop in the yeah. bucket, but that number gets bigger and bigger every year. Mm -hmm. um, and we've actually spawned 14 different species now. So yeah. starting with our first in uh -huh. 2019 in the pillar coral, we've now done 14 species in four years. Yeah and just increasing the number of offspring that survive and make it back out into the wild every single year. Yeah, you guys come a long way in four years. A long way, yeah, a long way. For sure. Started with you know one greenhouse with just a handful of pillar coral, uh -huh. and, and now at any point in time we have you know, 10 to 20,000 corals and 14 broodstock species. Oh, that's great. We'll go, how about we go right here? Boom, there Add we go. Add to the collection. Add to the collection. All right, thank you. Awesome. Cool. We'll keep going from here. Oh, wow. Look at all these acropora. It's the cropper room. <laughs> you know, our, our, our Caribbean yeah. Yeah. cropper yeah. are brown um, and probably more boring to yeah. most people. Um, but this, we're very, very proud of having these large, these are the elkhorn coral or a cropper of palmata. Um, we are the first facility also to reproduce this coral in a mm -hmm. lab. And these guys are so difficult. So many scientists were like, oh, you'll never yeah. be able to collect those and keep them in sure. a tank. You yeah. know? Um, and, and we've had to work hard and learn how to treat some diseases uh -huh. and you know really get their light and water chemistry just perfect. But as you can see, we're actually getting nice growth on them now and, they're, and we're getting spawning from them. This one is also, you know, extraordinarily um, threatened in the wild. There's only about 200 genetic individuals left wow, in Florida. Not many. And this one used to be really common. You know, it is a primary reef framework building species sure. all over the Caribbean. Uh -huh. um, and it has mostly lost to a different disease, you know, um, about 20 years ago. And uh -huh. just still trying to make sure that we have genetic diversity by making offspring of these. You know, you can asexually fragment these all day, yeah. but if those individuals are susceptible to a disease, yeah. then that disease event comes through and wipes out every single one of those asexual fragments. Oh. Um, whereas if you create 2,000 offspring, each one with a unique combination of genes, mm -hmm. then you hope that some of those individuals might actually be more resilient or disease resistant or heat tolerant or have any of those positive traits that you might be looking for. Sure, sure. So are these tanks different temperatures or anything like that? This versus that one, or are they all no, the same? No, these are, these are the same because okay. what we want is to have the most corals spawning at the same time gotcha. so that we can make multiple different crosses uh -huh. from different parents. Wow. Um, they just need to be so large <laughs> to have a good spawning output that we've dedicated multiple tanks to sure. the palmata. And then we have some cervicornis in here. So uh -huh. the Atlantic staghorn coral is a proper cervicornis. Um, and one project we've been working on is making the hybrid mm -hmm. of these two corals. They do form a hybrid that's really? found in the wild. Um, and this past year, we were able to successfully produce several hundred hybrid elkhorn, staghorn coral. Um, and you'll see those out in our greenhouse. I can't wait, yeah. So this is also a high flow tank? Yes, yeah. yes. They like, um, again, they're found in that wave breaking zone. These corals are mostly found in, you know, 10 to 15 feet of water and just growing literally right up to the surface. So a lot of light. So they're just used to, yeah, in, in these are getting about 600 par at the peak of the day. Mm -hmm. um, and then just constant beating wave energy. Yeah. So you're trying to re reproduce the uh, natural environment in here. Yeah. And these guys, um, really, if that par level isn't high enough, mm -hmm. they don't form these elk horn vertical branches. They'll just grow flat uh -huh. and they will grow flat forever. You will just have a disc of brown acropora with no branches. <laughs> um, and it wasn't really right. until we started cranking the light up and then really cranking the flow up that they started to finally form branches. So they're very reactive to that. Very, yeah. very reactive yeah. to their environmental conditions. It's Amazing. just what they are built to grow in. Yeah. It's really high light and really high flow. Yeah. A lot of divers in Florida know these corals for sure. Yeah, yeah. and it's still, it's amazing when you see a big colony. I mean, yeah. they can be the size of this tank or multiple, <laughs> you know, I mean, they yeah. can be the size of this room. That's um, insane. And they really are that primary species that breaks wave energy mm -hmm. um, and, and attenuates it so it doesn't come and erode our beaches and flood our condos along the shore. Yeah, yeah. 
That's another reason why it's so important to restore the reef. I mean, it's essential for our ecosystem here, especially yeah. in Florida. And, and Southeast Florida really is that primary place where wave energy is mm -hmm. broken and dissipated. Once the reefs are, are completely dead and start right. to erode, all of that wave energy comes right onto our beaches. And, and a lot erosion. of people don't realize how important that is to protect our coastline. Yeah. So in our seasonal temperature uh -huh. cycle, we go down to about 72 to 73 in the winter, okay. and then we'll go up to 84 in the summer. And the ocean in the Keys is actually getting much hotter than that in the summer now, but we find that 84 is enough for them to know that it's summer and trigger their reproduction, but it doesn't put them into a stress time where they might be bleaching or having some other stressful effect of high temperature. So our seasonal cycle does go from about 72 to 84 over the course of the year. In the Florida Keys, the, the highest phosphate you're ever gonna measure uh -huh. like in the ocean on the most polluted reef in the Keys is like 0.03 parts per million. Like that is considered nutrient enriched <laughs> yeah. in the ocean. Yeah. Um, and you might get to like one part per million of nitrate. And those are considered like runoff, like horrible, <laughs> horrible <laughs> reef. That we all know that nutrients can go quite a lot higher than that and be fine for corals. Um, but we do try, because our corals are going back in the ocean, mm -hmm. I don't want them to get acclimated to being at higher nutrient levels because then if they go back in the ocean yeah. and those nutrients are much lower, that can be a big problem Adverse, for them. Yeah. So we do try to keep our nutrients really under control in these systems. Um, calcium in the ocean is really only about 420, so we yeah. really are, are shooting for that. Right Alkalinity yeah. in the Florida Keys is like 125. In fact, most, and somebody ought to do the conversion on the video right. or something, right. um, 125 parts per million. Okay. And so we are riding a little bit higher than that. We'll maybe go 140, 150, just to try to encourage more coral in, more calcification in the corals. But we don't push it as high as many Indo-Pacific reef keepers um, push that alkalinity. Okay. Alkalinity in the ocean is actually much lower mm -hmm. than what most people keep in an aquarium. These are actually babies. <laughs> oh, these are babies. So we, yeah, they're they're babies. big babies. So we <laughs> settled these here as uh -huh. larvae in uh -huh. 2017. So this, these will be six years old this August, uh -huh. um, and they're already spawning. So these are actually making now that F2 generation. And that's just really cool that they, after five years, they became reproductive. So yeah. from a larvae, we were able to settle them, raise them, and now they're spawning. Um, and the reason they have this crazy big flat square, yeah. that's like their original settlement base that's uh -huh. been mounted on another one and mounted on another one. Uh -huh. And these corals will just keep growing this way forever unless you provide them enough light and flow. So once we got the flow and the light dialed in, they all finally decided it's time to make branches. Yeah, so that's a plate there? Yeah, it's, wow. a, it's a concrete like one of those. six by okay. six plate that we make ourselves here. <laughs> kind of the same lighting and uh, same flow, same filtration. Yeah, this system is pretty much identical to okay. the system over there, which is interesting because they don't behave identically. You can have exactly uh -huh. the same light, same pump, same filtration, same rocks, same everything, yeah. and they'll just be different. Yeah. Like they'll need slightly different dosing, um, they'll have slightly different algae communities. Yeah. It just goes to show you like you cannot ever replicate a tank exactly. Sure. Every single tank is slightly different, and that's what I love about this work mm -hmm. is that you literally learn something new with every single system that you set up. Everything, yeah, sure. every system does something slightly different, um, and you just have to learn how to adapt and deal with whatever issue that's happening in that system. So inside of this doer, we actually have a bunch of frozen coral sperm in liquid nitrogen. And that keeps it, actually we can revive that when wow. we thaw it and that sperm will come back to life uh -huh. and we can use it to fertilize fresh eggs. <laughs> So if it's the amazing. corals don't all spawn on the same day, or mm -hmm. we want to add some new parents into the mix, mm -hmm. we can just come to the prio lab and get some different sperm out of the doer. <laughs> That's great. You gotta do it all here. We are trying. Yeah, for sure. There, I can pick you up. There. So the 
baby diabema. Oh. And this species is really hard because they spend like 45 days in yeah. the plankton. So really? you have to have these specially designed chrysal systems over here mm -hmm. that they're also negatively buoyant and don't swim very well. Okay, so, so they start, start over here, mm -hmm. then they end up here, halfway house. They're here for about 45 days as larvae. Uh -huh. And then we will settle them either right in the chrysal or in these settlement bins. They grow out a little bit and then they'll get moved out to the greenhouse and eventually back out to the ocean okay. as well. Nice. But in the meantime, we can use them to help graze algae around our little baby corals. Yeah, essential. Yes. So this is our new coral building. Okay. So we're gonna go into our greenhouses. We have three 1,500 square foot greenhouses, but we decided actually to make the switch to LEDs and okay. inside a building. And a lot of people <laughs> ask me why. Like, you have natural light, why would you do right. that? Um, the fact of the matter is I can't control the spectrum on natural light. True. Um, and the spectrum that we get at the surface is not at all what the spectrum sure. is at 20, 30 feet underwater. Right. And a twin wall polycarbonate greenhouse actually removes even more blue from the nature of the polycarbonate. So you're just kind of stuck with the spectrum you have yeah. in a greenhouse and you don't have any option. Um, and then you have the problem of light pollution during spawning. Sure. So mm -hmm. even here where we're pretty remote, even those couple of street lights there are enough for a coral to think the moon is up. Now this is the greenhouse area? These are the greenhouses. Okay. Um, so when I first started, it was just this one greenhouse. Okay. And it had a bunch of sort of proof of concept used, not very nice aquarium equipment inside of it, and like a handful of pillar corals. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and now we have a very large facility with 10 to 20,000 corals at a time. So we actually renovated the entire facility and then added more greenhouses. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so first we'll go into greenhouse two. I'll show you some more of the brood stock and okay. then we'll go through like the whole process of from when they settle and grow out to what they look like okay. before they yeah, grow Yeah, that'd out. be great. So in right. this greenhouse, we hold more broodstock corals. And as you can see, this sign says yeah, pre-invasion corals. Like, what does that mean? Yeah, what's that mean? Um, that actually means before stony coral tissue loss disease. Okay. So the corals in this system mm -hmm. were collected ahead of that disease line. So in theory, they've never been exposed uh, to stony coral uh -huh. tissue loss disease. And these were collected as part of the Florida Reef Tract Rescue Project. Okay. So these, there were over 2,000 corals collected that are now being held at zoos and aquariums across the country mm -hmm. um, that are members of the AZA. Okay. And we are holding um, about 200 of those individuals here and also spawning them here in our greenhouse and also upstairs. So how, how old are these corals in captivity? How long have they been in captivity for? These have been here. Um, we got our first rescue corals uh -huh. in 2018. Wow. So this is Musa angulosa, the spiny flower coral. So yeah, they have big fleshy polyps. Looks yeah. a little bit like a lobophilia or something. Yeah. yeah for sure. But it's actually stalked. Wow. So the skeleton is, it is stalked. Like, like branches? It's like yeah. a, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Wow. Um, and this is Colpophilia. They often have that nice green valley in between the uh -huh. ridges. That's beautiful. The green's re very brilliant on that one. And this is a very red spectrum greenhouse. So you put yeah. these guys under a, that more traditional like blue hobbyist spectrum and those greens really do pop on Absolutely. these species. Yeah. Some Atlantic corals are pretty. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Gyres okay. and pulse pumps a lot. These also have apex, mostly just for temperature control, monitoring. And then you have a big skimmer over here? Yeah, we yeah, have yeah. our MRC skimmers. Okay. 
Looks familiar in a, a reactor. You got carbon in here. Yeah, we carbon got colors. MRC yeah. reactors and skimmers. Um, that one just has activated carbon in okay. it right now, and then, and then we'll add GFO if needed. But the interesting thing is um, none of our tanks actually have fish. <laughs> so it's one thing, it's, we can have fish. Again, they would yeah. have to be from Florida. Okay. But we just don't want to worry about fish quarantine and fish diseases yeah. and, and all of that. So it's easier to just not have fish. Um, I, for the most part, we can control algae with other herbivores and invertebrates, um, yeah. so we don't have fish. So we don't get a lot of nutrient buildup. The mm. only thing we're feeding is the corals. We target feed those for yeah. the most part. Um, so we don't have very high nutrients in here. So most of the time we don't even need GFO. Um, okay. Occasionally, if, we, if it starts to get above 0.1, we might throw a little bit of GFO mm -hmm. on there and bring it down a little, but we don't want to tank it out at zero. That's like the worst thing you can yeah. do is just tank out the phosphate completely. Right. So for the most part, we don't run it. Now, what do you feed? Yeah, we feed all kinds of things. Yeah, you know, pretty much anything yeah. on the market. We've got frozen copepods, frozen mycids, wow. um, all different types of pelleted foods. We have reef roids, golden pearls. Um, what we can't feed, though, mm -hmm. is anything that has probiotics. Okay. Because, again, the biosecurity of these corals going out into the ocean, yeah. I can't give them a bacteria, a live bacteria culture that I don't know the origin of it. So I can't give these, it may be great for them. Yeah. Sure, I agree, it may be. Maybe. But if I don't know where that bacteria was isolated from, I can't purposely give it to these oh. corals knowing that they can carry it back out into the ocean. Yeah, yeah, it makes sense when yeah. you think of it like that. All right. We made it. <laughs> so in here, okay. these are all babies from August of last year. Wow. So about six months, August and September. Okay. They're pretty big now, actually. So these are actually the babies of some of those brain corals you were just looking at in Greenhouse 2. And as we talked about keeping track of everything yeah. and labeling, so each tile has a label on the bottom. This is literally just Sharpie with with clear silicone. Okay, right on top of yep. it? Yep. Yeah, I was wondering and how you kept it yeah, like that. Yeah, so this yeah. is, and we'll pre-label them, and then, so the corals settle on this top tile, mm -hmm. and then depending on how many it looks like we have, we'll make a bunch of these bottom tiles with yeah. the label. Okay. And then we pull them out of the settlement bin and just glue them on there so they have the label. Okay. Um, so this is telling me the genus and species, mm -hmm. the year that it spawned, and what batch number it was. So I can go into our computer and look at, this is Pseudodiploria strigosa 2022 batch number three. And I can tell you exactly what day it spawned, who its parents were, and all the information about where it was settled, where it's been. Um, and then we don't give each baby an identifier because that would be crazy. Yeah, it would so be. So they are just tracked as a batch. Okay. As a batch from a certain set of parents. So this is one right here with this number here? Yep, exactly. Okay. Gotcha. And then you can see some of them are quite large already. So <laughs> yeah, that's only sure. six months old. Wow, so you can see it developing, in the, yeah. In the right conditions, they wow. really can get size to them pretty quickly. And then yeah. we've got some small lithopoma snails that have been growing right along with them yeah. that are helping to keep them clean. So these corals here are the hybrids that uh -huh. we were talking about between the staghorn and the elkhorn coral. Um, and these corals, we are hoping, will have higher heat tolerance, so be able to live through warmer seawater temperatures and climate change. Mm -hmm. um, and these will actually be planted off of a military installation in the Keys. No way. Yeah, so Not these cool. little corals are, are being grown for the Department of Defense um, DARPA project um, to create a thermally tolerant reef, artificial reef structure. Okay. So not top secret then? No, it's not top okay, secret. Okay, not top secret. We're allowed to talk about it. <laughs> We're also working on creating chimeric, so two no baby corals yeah. that fuse together completely. Get out of so here. So these are two elkhorn corals that were placed right next to each other, and we know that they're actually half siblings, which uh -huh. is what that HS tells us. So one of their parents is the same, yeah. so they're related. 
Um, and we're seeing how many of those will actually form a fully integrated true chimera, which does seem to be happening in some of them, which is pretty and cool. And can you replant those back in the keys? We can. Yeah. We'll be, we are only allowed to do that for this project okay. um, at this point, but we're hoping if we show that these corals are very resilient yeah. um, and can have really high survival in really extreme conditions, yeah. then they would be encouraged to allow that in other places. That makes sense, yeah. Awesome. And then this is what that next stage looks like. Wow. So this Much is, bigger, yeah. yeah. These are a little bit older. This yeah. coral spawned in May, okay. so these are about 10 months old. Got it. It's a lot. There's a lot. Yeah, and we actually you're doing have, a good job we here. 4,000 of this species from last 4, May. 4,000. Mm -hmm. Now, how many of these will get replanted back in the reef All eventually? Of All of them. Wow. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So we, as of now, every single coral that we grow here is for restoration. Okay. So most of our funding comes from state and federal government to actually grow corals to put back out onto yeah. the reef. Yeah. These are all that grooved brain coral, the one that we saw upstairs uh -huh. in the spawning lab. These all came from there. So you can okay. see the size range is pretty pretty big. Yeah. Each individual is slightly different. These corals are same parents same birthday wow. just the slightest thing different in their yeah. rearing can make all the difference in the world um, so these guys will go back to the reef first usually once they get to the full plug uh -huh. and these are three centimeter plugs they are good to go okay yeah it's getting close it's getting close yeah, this will be yeah. once it gets to here this will be another two three months and it'd be good to go okay so do about a yeah. year to a year and a half okay do you actually go out and do it yourself Is sometimes it yeah we we don't yeah. have it's not cost effective for us to do all right. five thousand right. of them from tampa mm -hmm. um so m most of them we'll just give to other restoration practitioners like okay. University of Miami, Nova Southeastern, Coral Restoration Foundation, FWC. Um, but we do one trip a year where we do outplant our own. So this greenhouse is our third greenhouse, third. which was really like the evolution of the engineering of the greenhouses. So in this one, all of the chilled water lines and electrical lines are actually in the slab um, because they were they were causing shading from overhead. So when your light is overhead and moving, the last thing you want is a ton of pipes and conduit over your head. Makes sense. So we decided to go ahead and put all of that in the slab okay. um, in this greenhouse. Smart. So it gives yeah. it a lot cleaner look. For sure. And then the panels are slightly different. They're okay. a little more full spectrum panel so it just has a slightly bluer feel in this greenhouse and it actually is a slightly different light spectrum very cool very cool this one was settled here as a larvae uh -huh. in 2017. Wow, wow big big yeah and it's been fragmented multiple <laughs> times so most of these pieces are from it and there's pieces of it all over the place yeah and this one spawned at three years of age okay so this is the coral that actually taught us that staghorn coral can spawn yeah. three years post settlement. That would be good in the lagoon. Yeah. He'd love it in there. Really natural. He loves it in here obviously. And these things <laughs> just uh, eat up the light. I mean Cervicornis will yeah. grow at 800, 900 just <laughs> How about the calcium? It, like a weed. Oh they eat it up like yeah, crazy. Yeah yeah. Wow. Super big. That's, that's a big frag. Just, just, a, just, just a tiny frag. Yeah, just, a tiny, <laughs> just a tiny baby. It's massive. But the reason, yeah, the reason we are letting these keep growing is because these are brood stocks. Okay. So these there's will a, spawn okay. um, and make more offspring. So this is just some more brood stock of. So this of is the one tank, part. one system? Yeah. By so yeah. the interesting thing is when you're raising the coral babies, uh -huh. they need to get that symbiont or algae in their tissues from somewhere. So the reason we have these systems set up like this where we can actually keep parent colonies in the sump is so they're constantly supplying good bacteria, mucus, symbionts into the system so that the babies can acquire them. So the babies need to get them from the water column. Um, so when we settle babies in these shallow trays uh -huh. and rear them, they're getting all of that probiotic um, bacteria and symbionts from the parents that live in the sun. Okay. 
The, we keep the babies separate because you need different herbivores there. Uh -huh. You can't use a big urchin or something with these tiny yeah. coral babies. Makes sense. And you want to keep them as pest free as possible. They will get killed by hydroids. They'll get killed by the tiniest thing that won't affect a big coral. Yeah. Um, so we want to be able to keep that shallow tray isolated so we can take the babies out and bleach it or clean it, acid wash it, and then all the food that goes into the babies we can pull out with the sock before it's getting in with all the brood stuff. Yeah. So Carrie, if you want to see more, where can we find you next? I'm going to be speaking at Reef of Palooza in Orlando on Saturday, April 22nd at 2.30. So come check out the show and check out the talk. Thanks so much. I appreciate the tour and oh, your time. Thanks for coming to visit You're anytime. You know, good luck with your facility Thank you. and come check out our new facility when it's up and running. We'll be back. Help us with the lights. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> let's get Josh out here, maybe. Josh, thanks for checking out our video. Don't forget to like and subscribe, and we'll see you guys on the next video. Take care.